Hello everyone. Today I'm going to share with you the research from my group, initiated by my master student Megan Varney, and then extensively developed by my PhD student Tegan Bait, with assistance from my undergraduate student Isra Taylor and PhD student Joshua Dickey. The research also involved collaboration with Michael Norton from RIT. And Chisha Che from NCKU. In its research, we investigate how mixing is performed by active fluid. We will look into how active fluid can mix the suspended components, or mix with different kind of fluid. Here, let's begin. First, let's ask ourselves a question: What is mixing? Well, mixing is a ubiquitous phenomenon in our everyday life. Generally, when we say mixing, we mean a physical process of component distribution that evolves from non-uniform to uniform. For example, when a cube of salt mixes with pure water, the salt distributions evolve from a cube to homogeneously distributed in water, and we get the salt water. So this is the meaning of mixing. But how does mixing take place? Generally, mixing can happen in two different ways. One way is via an active process, like in this example. We want to mix blue dough ball with a yellow dough ball. How can it happen? Well, to well mix these two dough balls, we only need to first stretch. The blue yellow dough balls, then fold it, and then we repeat the process over and over. Eventually, we get a dough ball that has a uniform color, indicating that the dough is well mixed. So, active mixing process involves repeated stretching and folding the materials. And what is contrary to active mixing is passive mixing, like in this example. A tea bag is tossed in a cup of water, and the tea ingredients spontaneously diffuse from the tea bag to the rest of the water, and eventually we have a cup of tea. This process is driven by diffusion, and no external energy input is needed, so this process of mixing is passive. Okay. So the mixing examples we showed so far are in the microscopic scale. How about the mixing in the microscopic scale, such as in microfluid device? Well, for passive mixing, it can still happen because there's nothing stopping diffusion from happening at a microscopic scale. However, diffusion is a slow process, and we have limited control over diffusion rate. So passive mixing. It's not an efficient means to rely on for micro mixing. How about for active mixing? We know active mixing relies on the repeated process of stretching and folding fluids, and during this process, turbulence forms. Common example is stirring the coffee milk mixture. However, here is a challenge for micro mixing: forming turbulence. Requires the fluid to have the Reynolds number greater than one. Reynolds number depends on the flow speed and system scale. And at the microscopic scale, Reynolds number is much less than one, which means turbulence cannot form. Flows are laminar, and laminar flows cannot perform mixing. So what can we do? Well, performing micro mixing is a century-old problem, and we are not the first person to encounter this challenge. There have been various solutions to promote micro mixing. For example, one of my favorites is to introduce the vibrating bubbles. Like in this movie, we see that air bubbles are vibrated by the piezo, and creates flows in a microfluid device. And in this method. That use the vibrating bubbles to create a flow that is sufficiently fast that 
the Reynolds number can be greater than one, so turbulence formed. There are other examples, such as introducing microstirrers or using temperature gradient to induce convection. And most of these methods requires external energy input, which is fine. But it would be more convenient if we can perform the micromixing internally without the aid from the outside. And the success of internal micromixing can further promote miniaturization of micromixing device because the setup used to provide the external energy input will no longer be needed. Well, that is the focus of today's talk. The solution we propose to perform micromixing internally is to introduce active fluid. So, in this talk, we will investigate how active fluid can mix the suspended components, as well as mix with different kinds of fluid. Well, there are various kinds of active fluid, and in this talk, we will focus on using microtubule-based active fluid because it has been intensively characterized and modeled, so we can have a rich literature as our reference to understand the mixing process driven by this active fluid. And in this active fluid system, there are three major components. The first component is microtubules, which are illustrated as a green rod in a schematic diagram. We extracted and purified tubulins from bovine brains and polymerized tubulins to get microtubules. The second component is depleting polymers, which induces depletion forces to bundle microtubules. Then. The bundled microtubules will be breached by our third component, kinesin motor dimers, which will drive apart pairs of antiparallel microtubules, causing the interfilamentous sliding. Here, I want to remind you that this is a non-equilibrium process. For the motor to drive microtubules, we need to feed it with ATP, and motor will convert it to ADP. So ATP is a fuel in this active fluid system. So in the lab, this interfilamentous sliding is observed. Then the collective dynamics of this sliding is microtubules forming bundles that undergo repeated process of extending, buckling, and annealing. Then at a microscopic scale. These standing microtubule bundles formed a cross-linked microtubule network, whose structure constantly self-rearranges, called active gel. At the millimeter scale, we can see the active gel constantly drives the red dots, which are freely suspended tracers. I can track the motion of tracers, and their trajectories reveal that. Active fluid induces turbulence-like chaotic flows. So now the question is: Can we utilize these flows to promote micromixing? And how much will they boost the micromixing? So to investigate the mixing performance driven by active fluid. We need to dope test component for active fluid to mix. Here we choose fluorescent dyes, or more specifically, fluorescein molecules. So the experiment would be like mix milk with coffee using spoons. Here the coffee is water, milk is fluorescein, and spoon is our active fluid. And to make this pyramid more reproducible and controllable, we use UV-activated fluorescein, so we can control the initial distribution of fluorescein. So this fluorescein is initially caged and uniformly suspended in active fluid. And since they are caged, 
they are not fluorescent, so we do not see them in our microscope. Then we expose them to UV light. UV exposure uncages these fluorescent molecules, and they become fluorescent. Here is an example. We prepare a sample with cage fluorescent, and under our microscope, we do not see anything. Then we place a checkable pattern mask and apply UV light. We got checkable pattern UV light, and cage fluorescent in these areas will be uncaged. So after we turn off UV light and remove the mask, we see the checkable pattern fluorescent by our fluorescent microscopy. So using the cage fluorescent, we can control. Where and when to suspend the fluorescein in our active fluid system? Here, we design the missing experiment by activating the fluorescein in the left half of the sample, and then we observe how the fluorescein disperses to the rest of the sample. As a control, we have an inactive fluid. Which is active fluid system without ATP, so motors are not fueled, no flows are generated. So in the inactive fluid system, dyes disperse purely by diffusion of dyes. Then we have an active fluid system, and in this movie, we see that dyes are actively driven by flows and disperse to the rest of the sample. In about an hour. So, in active fluid, dyes are dispersed mainly by active fluid convection. And in this pair of experiments, it is obvious that active fluid can promote mixing. But the real question is, by how much? So, to answer that question, we need to first find a way to quantify the mixing performance. And one way to quantify the mixing is to analyze the decay rate of multi-scale norm. So, what is multi-scale norm? Well, this is a definition. It is based on the Fourier coefficient of spatial distribution of suspended components. We are not the first person to use this quantifying method. Santillan and Shelley used this method to quantify the mixing performance of active fluid in their simulation. Their simulation is similar to our experiment. Their simulation has a scalar field represented by colors, and they look into how the scalar fields are transported by active fluid flow. They analyze the multi-scale norm of the scalar field. And they find out that the multi-scale norm decays exponentially. So, inspired by their studies, we also analyzed the multi-scale norm of the brightness of the dye's micrographs, and plotted it in log linear axis. And we found out that the data are almost linear as well. We suggest that our multi-scale norm also decays exponentially. So we can fit it to the exponential function and extract the decay time scale t naught, which we called mixing time. For inactive fluid system, the mixing time is 24 hours. For active fluid, the mixing time is 1.3 hours. So this analysis reveals that active fluid can significantly enhance the micro mixing process. And reduce the missing time by factor of 20. So now our next question is, what is a controlling parameter for the missing time? Well, naively you might think that the missing time was controlled by the flow speed. However, our extensive studies show that the flow speed does not really affect the missing time directly. Because imagine we have an active fluid that flows fast and forms many small vortices. These vortices will transport dyes. 
But since vortices are small, dyes are transported at the scale of a vortex size. So transportation is slow. Contrarily, imagine active fluid forms a global flow like a river, then it can transport dyes much faster compared with another active fluid system with the same flow speed. As such, mixing time should not only depend on flow speed, but also depend on length scale of the flow. As such, the answer for this question, what is a controlling parameter for the missing time? The answer should be the Peckley number. So what is the Peckley number? Well, in case you never heard the Peckley number, here is a brief introduction. Peckley number is a dimensionless parameter that considers both flow speed and flow length scale. It's the product of these two quantities divided by diffusion coefficient. In this case, the diffusion coefficient of dyes is measured to be 97 micrometers square per second. So the physical meaning of the Peckley number is the ratio of convective transport rate to diffusive transport rate. That is to say, if the system has a Peckley number smaller than of order one, then mass transport of the system is dominated by diffusion. Contrarily, if the system has a packet number larger than of order 1, the mass transport is dominated by convection. So in this case, the packet number for inactive fluid is 0, because we know the dyes disperse via diffusion only. For active fluid sample, we can track tracer's motion, to get a flow speed and flow length scale, and determine the packet number to be 21, which indicates that dye dispersion in this sample is dominated by active fluid-induced convection. So now, we know the packet number is a controlling parameter, then we can measure the mixing time for the samples with different packet numbers. And our data shows that the mixing time monotonically decreases with the increasing Peckley number, which demonstrates that the convective transport induced by active fluid can significantly enhance the micromixing. Here, our data showed that introducing active fluid to microfluid devices can indeed boost its mixing performance. But keep in mind that in this experiment, Dyes were suspended in active fluid system with uniform activity. We know that mixing is a process from non-uniform to uniform. What if the activity was initially not uniform? How would that impact the mixing time of dyes? In other words, what is the role of activity distribution of active fluid in micromixing of dyes? So to address this question, we need to find a way to create non-uniform activity in active fluid system and repeat the dye mixing experiments. Our method of creating such non-uniform activity was to introduce caged ATP. Similar to caged fluorescine, caged ATP cannot be hydrolyzed by kinesin. So samples with only cage ATP is inactive. And upon UV exposure, ATP is uncaged and can be used by kinesin to generate motion. Here is an example. We prepared a sample with cage ATP. So in the beginning, the sample is quiescent. Then, we expose to the left side of the sample to UV light, which releases ATP and activates the fluid on that side. Then, an interesting thing happened. We found out that the active zone progressed to the inactive zone, and eventually, the whole sample is activated. And the reason for this propagation is because ATP can disperse to the inactive zone by either diffusion 
or convection. Once ATP is transported to the inactive zone, it can activate the fluid and induce flows. So the propagation of this active-inactive interface is a consequence of ATP transport. We will talk more about this phenomenon later in this talk, but here let's focus on how this active-inactive fluid system disperses the suspended dyes. So here is one of the typical experiments. Note that dyes and ATP were both caged initially, and uncaged with UV light. So their initial distribution was the same. So in the beginning, dyes and ATP both distributed on the left half of the sample, and over time, both dyes and activity expands to the rest of the sample. And we can measure the missing time as a function of the packet number. Here we see that the missing time decreases with increasing packet number, which is also expected. But we may be more interested in comparing this data with the previous one with uniform activity distribution. So here is a comparison. The left data is from activity non-uniform system. The right data is from activity uniform system. By comparing both data, we can see that the dependence of mixing time on the packet number are almost the same. In fact, if you look closely, the numbers are almost the same too. So how come both data major in different systems are similar? Here are the reasons we think are the cause of the similarity between these two sets of data. Because in the activity non-uniform system, dyes and ATP were both activated the same way. Their initial distributions were the same, which means dyes are activated in active zone, followed by transportation induced by active fluid. So dyes always stay in the active zone. If dyes always stay in the active zone, they cannot sense the existence of inactive zone. So that makes sense that how inactive fluid distributed does not matter the dye dispersion. In other words, missing time of dyes mainly depends on the packet number, regardless of the distribution of activity. However, there is a caveat for this result. This result is valid under the condition that the dyes were initially distributed in the active zone. If the dyes were initially placed in the inactive zone, then the results would be very different because dye dispersion would be governed by diffusion in the beginning until the active zone is bended to its area to disperse dyes actively. Okay, so we have studied the role of activity distribution. Then how about the role of dye distribution? So far, we have only investigated one distribution, which is the dyes initially distributed in the left half of the sample. So the question would be, how would the initial dye distribution affect its missing time? So to address this question, we designed a series of experiments that distribute dyes in a checkerboard pattern with different grid sizes. For example, in this movie, we distributed the dyes in a 3mm by 3mm checkerboard and compare it with a 1mm by 1mm checkerboard sample. By just watching these movies, we can see that the dye is distributed in a smaller grid size checkerboard, which homogeneity faster than a larger grid size one. In fact, we systematically vary the grid size from 1mm to 3mm while measuring the missing time and found out that the missing time is sensitive to the grid size. Increasing the grid size from 1mm to 3mm increases the missing time from 8 minutes to 46 minutes. <laughs> 
This result is expected because the smaller grid size means the dyes only need to travel a smaller distance to reach the homogeneity. But anyhow, here we see that the dye's initial distribution plays a direct role on its mixing process. Up to now, we have demonstrated the mixing of suspended dyes. However, we have seen multiple times in the movies that dyes are not the only components that are mixed in this active Fourier system. We also see that the system contains active and inactive fluids, and active fluid gradually blends and mixes with the inactive fluid, and system becomes activity uniform. So the next question is, how does active fluid mix with inactive fluid? Well, let's look at this movie again. We know that after UV activation, ATP is released, fluid is activated, and form an interface between active and inactive fluids. And this interface propagates toward the inactive zone until the inactive zone vanishes. We know the propagation of interface is a consequence of ATP transport which can be described with a mass transport equation. Here, C is ATP concentration, D is diffusivity of ATP, U is flow velocity of active fluid. We will explore how we can use the mass transport equation to describe the ATP transport so as to learn about how active fluid mixes with inactive fluid. So, in the mass transport equation, there are two terms on the right-hand side. The first term describes the mass transport by diffusion. The second term corresponds to active fluid-induced convection. So, this equation describes how ATP dispersed via diffusion and convection. Here, let's consider a case where only diffusion takes place. In other words, let's consider a system with a small packet number. So we can drop the second term on the right hand side. And the equation is reduced to the fixed law of diffusion equation. We also know that ATP was initially distributed on one side of the sample. So we can use error function to mimic this distribution for the initial condition of ATP concentration. Then, we can solve the diffusion equation to determine C. Here, we show the solutions of C for two different initial ATP concentrations. In both cases, we can see that ATP initially distributed in the left half of the system, and then gradually diffuses to the rest of the system, until the homogeneity is reached. So now, we have determined the ATP distribution. We know that where there are ATP molecules, there is activity, and higher ATP concentration leads to higher flow speed. In our previous study, we found an empirical michaelis menten based relation between flow speed of active fluid and ATP concentration. This flow speed ATP relation allows us to convert the ATP concentration to flow speed, which means in the movie, we can change the y-axis from C to V-bar. Now, we have a solution showing the evolution of activity distribution, which shows that the activity distribution evolves from one-sided to homogeneously distributed. This is consistent with our experimental observation. Now, let's briefly summarize what we got so far. We consider the diffusion region of ATP transport and solve the diffusion equation to determine the ATP distribution. Then we adapt the flow speed ATP relation 
to convert ATP concentration to FLOS B profiles, which shows that the active inactive interface propagates to the right. So in this plot, we define the interface position as the midpoint of the transition from active to inactive zone. Then the interface displacement delta x is the distance between the system midpoint and the interface position. And based on this definition, we can plot the interface displacement as a function of time for various initial ATP concentrations. We can see that the interface has a rapid movement in the beginning, followed by a gradual slowing down. Then we analyze the squared interface displacement as a function of time and plot it in the log linear axis. And surprisingly, we found out that all of the data appears to be a straight line with a slope of 1. This result shows that the square interface displacement increases linearly with time with a proportional constant pi called interface progression coefficient. So for each data set, we can treat pi as a fitting parameter and plot it as a function of initial ATP concentration, which shows that PI increases with C0. This data show that a higher initial concentration causes the interface to propagate faster. And all of these dots are numerical results. In fact, we can solve PI as a function of C0 analytically. And we found out that the analytical result reproduces our numerical result, showing the internal consistency of our model. Now, let's examine overall what the model says. The model first shows that the squared interface displacement is proportional to time, which suggests that the active inactive interface progresses in a diffusion-like manner regardless of initial ATP concentration. Note that I say diffusion-like and not diffusion because diffusion has a specific meaning. It means mean square displacement proportional to time lapse, and ours are squared interface displacement instead. Also, this result is under the condition that ATP disperses by diffusion only. So, if ATP only diffuses, then the progression of active-inactive interface is diffusion-like. Then, we notice that the interface progression coefficient PI increases with ATP initial concentration C0, which means a higher initial ATP concentration causes the interface to progress faster. So, all of these are modeling prediction for active-inactive fluid mixing. Next, we want to verify if the model is valid by comparing it with the experiments. Now, let's look at the experiment again. We have seen this movie multiple times. This movie shows the progression of active-inactive interface. To analyze the interface progression, we dope tracer particles, which revealed the flow speed distribution. Then we average the flow speed vertically, which allows us to plot the flow speed profile across the sample. Here, for the comparison purpose, we normalize the flow speed profile. The normalized flow speed profile shows an initial sharp transition from active to inactive zone. This transition area represents the active-inactive interface. Then this interface widens and shifts toward the inactive zone. Then we follow the same analysis to extract the interface displacement as a function of time. The insect shows an initial rapid movement followed by a gradual slowing down. Then we square the y-axis of the inset to get a square interface displacement versus time. 
which shows that a long time scale, a square interface displacement increases linearly with time. Here we define gamma as the exponent of time. We call gamma interface progression exponent. Then we analyze the interface progression exponent for samples with different initial ATP concentrations. We found out that gamma is basically one, an invariant to initial ATP concentration. Then we did a similar analysis to extract the corresponding interface progression coefficient, pi, which revealed that pi increases with initial ATP concentration. So these are experimental results. Now what we are interested in is to compare it with the model prediction. Here is the first part of the modeling results. We compare it with the corresponding experimental results, and we find out that both experiments and models show a diffusion-like interface progression, with the interface progression exponent gamma equal 1. So for gamma, experiments and models are consistent. Then how about the interface progression coefficient, pi? This is a modeling prediction for pi versus c0. To compare, we merge it with the experimental figure, and surprisingly, the merged plot shows that the experimental results and modeling results were incredibly consistent, with a difference within 10%. Note that in the model, we did not introduce fitting parameter. So this is a direct plot, and it is consistent quantitatively with experimental result, which shows that our model can well describe the mixing of active and inactive fluid system. Here, let's briefly summarize our work. We consider the region of low Peckley lambert active fluid system and in this system, ATP dispersion is dominated by diffusion. So interface progression exponent is 1. Interface progresses in a diffusion-like manner. This progression can be well described with a diffusion-based model, in terms of interface progression exponent, gamma, and coefficient, pi. So at this point, we have a good understanding of active inactive fluid mixing at low Peckley Lambert region. But how about the high Peckley Lambert region? To complete our understanding of the mixing between active and inactive fluids, we must know how they mix at high Peckley Lambert region. And we know that at high Peckley Lambert region, convection dominates the ATP transport. So we can no longer use diffusion equation. To construct a model for high Peckley Lambert system, we have to introduce hydrodynamics and pneumatic kinetics. So here is how we construct the model. First of all, for high Peckley Lambert region, we have to include both terms in the right-hand side of the mass transport equation. In particular, the second term that governs the convective transport plays the dominant role. Then in this term, we have to know U. And U is flow velocity of active fluid, which is expected to follow the Stokes equation. Stokes equation is similar to Newton's law saying that flows are driven by forces. And in this system, the flows are driven by active stress. Active stress is induced by extensile microtubule bundles, which are modeled as self-elongating rods, inducing the stress that depends on activity coefficient alpha and pneumatic order tensor Q. For alpha, Previous studies showed that it depends on ATP concentration. For Q, it is the pneumatic order tensor of rods, which is expected to follow the kinetic equation. 
So in our model, we have three primary equations: mass transport equation, Stokes equation, and magnetic kinetic equation. We have three unknown variables: c, u, and q. So there are three unknown variables coupled to three equations. Mathematically, we should be able to determine these variables. Here are the modeling results. We solve the equations with three different parameter sets of activity coefficients and diffusion coefficients. The top panels are ATP distribution. The bottom panels are flow speed distribution. Here we start with a control with zero activity. Then we turn down the activity by setting a finite value of activity coefficient. Then we tried a third simulation with the same activity coefficient, but with enhanced diffusion coefficient, to explore the role of diffusion in active fluid system. To examine the model results in more details, we collect typical frames of these simulations. For the first simulation, where activity is turned off, there's no surprise that we got no flow. Also, ATP dispersion is dominated by diffusion, which is expected. That means our active fluid model covers the low packet Lambert region. Then, in the second simulation, we turn down the activity, and flows are generated. ATP dispersion is dominated by convection, which is also expected. Then, in our third simulation, where the diffusion is further enhanced, the simulation shows that ATP reach the homogeneity at a dimensionless time of 20. Whereas in the second simulation, ATP was still non-uniform, which shows that in the third simulation, ATP dispersion was further enhanced by increasing diffusion coefficient. So, this result shows that our simulation can include ATP transport driven by both diffusion and convection. And which mechanism dominates the ATP transport depends on the competition between these two mechanisms. So now we have established a simulation platform for mixing process of active and inactive fluids. We can use the simulation to explore how the mixing process depends on activity coefficients and diffusion coefficients. Here are the typical simulation data sets for interface progression exponents gamma. The data shows that when the diffusion coefficient is two, gamma remains two, which suggests that the active inactive interface progresses in a super diffusion-like manner, or more specifically, ballistic-like manner. In this simulation. Diffusive transport is nearly negligible, and ATP dispersion is governed mainly by convection. Then another data set with a diffusion coefficient of eight, we have gamma remains at one, which shows that the interface progresses in a diffusion-like manner. In these simulations. Diffusion rate is sufficiently high that convective transport becomes negligible. This simulation corresponds to our previous investigation for low packetly Lambert region. Then, for the data set with an intermediate diffusion coefficient of four, interestingly, we found that gamma changes from one to two as the activity coefficient is increased. This result shows that the interface progression transitions from diffusion-like to super diffusion-like as the activity level of active fluid is increased, and convection gradually dominates the ATP transport over diffusion. So these are our modeling prediction. 
Next, what we are interested in is whether or not we can observe such a transition in this experiment. So, long story short, we repeated the experiments of measuring gamma while increasing the Peckley number to 16, where a convective transport is expected to emerge. In this experimental data set, each point represents a single experiment. So overall, the data are a bit noisy. To demonstrate whether the transition is observed in our experiments, we took the moving average of our dataset, which is the magenta curve. And based on this curve, we can see that gamma remains almost 1 for packet numbers smaller than 3. This corresponds to the diffusion-dominated region we discussed previously. And in this region, interface progresses in a diffusion-like manner. Then, as packet number increases over 5, we saw that gamma increases and appears to saturate at 1.5. This increase demonstrates that the emergence of convective transport transitions the interface progression from diffusion-like to super diffusion like. So, this is our experimental observation. If we compare it with our active fluid simulation, we can see that they are qualitatively consistent. At least, both the experiment and model demonstrate the transition from diffusion like to super diffusion like behaviors of interface progression. This transition is controlled by the Peckley number. However, while the modeling results qualitatively agree with the experimental results, there is a detailed discrepancy. For experiments, we observe that gamma appears to saturate at 1.5, whereas the model shows cases with gamma equal 2. The model predicts that interface progresses faster than experiments. The potential reason for such a discrepancy might be due to the fact that our model did not consider rheology of cross-linked microtubule network. Fluid is activated as soon as ATP is transported to its location. However, in experiments, fluid activation takes finite time because microtubule bundles are initially cross-linked by motor dimers due to lack of ATP. And after the arrival of ATP, motor dimers can start stepping and mobilize or fluidize the network. But this process takes finite time, so can slow down the active inactive interface progression and lower gamma. So to improve the model, one can consider introduce ATP-dependent rheological constant and additional relevant dynamic processes to represent the network dynamics at a low ATP concentration area. Now, let's sum up what we talked about today. In this talk, we investigated two kinds of mixing in active fluid system. The first is the mixing of suspended components, which are the fluorescent dyes. The second is the mixing of active and inactive fluids. And for mixing of fluorescent dyes, we show that the mixing times decrease with increasing Peckley number, demonstrating that active fluid can indeed enhance micro-mixing process. Then we show that the mixing time increases with increasing checkerboard grid sizes of dyes' initial distribution. For the mixing of active and inactive fluids, we show that the mixing process was the consequence of ATP transport. We investigated the transport at low and high packet number regimes. At low packet number regime, diffusion dominates the transport process, which caused the active inactive interface to progress in a diffusion like manner. And this mixing process is well described by a diffusion-based model. 
in high packet lumber region, convection dominates the transport. Our data show that the active inactive interface progresses in a super diffusion like manner. This missing process can be captured by our active fluid hydrodynamic model. And while our model qualitatively agrees with experimental results, it overshot the interface progression exponent. We believe this discrepancy may be amended by introducing microtubular network rheology in the model, so it can better predict the mixing process of active and inactive fluids. Overall, our work shows that Pecky Lambert plays a dominant role to describe the missing behaviors of active fluid systems. This work paves the path to design of microfluid devices that use active fluid to promote or optimize the micro-missing process to enhance production efficiency in chemical and biological engineering and pharmaceutical development. The results may also provide insight into intracellular missing processes because the cytoplasm is streaming that supports organelle within cells is powered by cytoskeleton filaments and motor proteins that function similarly to microtubule kinase in active fluid. So all of these are our work for self-mixing of activity non-uniform active fluid. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about our work, please do not hesitate to contact us. Here, we thank you for your attention to this talk. <laughs>